Good afternoon. Today I want to talk a little bit about the recent innovation in discussions concerning when the baptism of the Holy Spirit takes place amongst Wesleyan scholarship. Today is popular, especially since the work of Mildred Bangs, Weinkoop, and H. Ray Dunning, which was summarized pretty accurately in the work a Century of Holiness Theology by Mark R. Quanstrom within the Church of the Nazarene. In that book, in chapter 8, he discusses how since 1985 there have been some who were not satisfied with how the manual currently reads in the Church of the Nazarene. If you look in the article of faith in the Church of the Nazarene's manual, 2013 to 2017, it still declares, after some years of dispute, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit takes place at the moment of entire sanctification. There's no discussion in the manual about how this could also take place at justification. Well, today I want to discuss how John Fletcher's theology developed, how Wesley was the first one to make this stand, as Timothy Smith, the Nazarene theologian and historian, has argued, and that Fletcher actually developed his dispensational teaching, which is not the typical dispensational teaching of the Calvinists. It's a totally different doctrine that basically is just a term used from Scripture in order to describe the different degrees of faith. If you remember, the contention of modern scholarship in most regards, um, referring to the need for uh, a better and more accurate discussion of Wesley's personal experience and his doctrinal teaching, it all comes out, they believe, the modern scholars do, from his later footnotes that he attached to his Aldersgate account in the 1770s um, regarding how there are degrees of faith, that there's not just the work of, entire, of justification, there's also deeper degrees of faith that Christians can experience. And Wesley also described, prior to this, the importance of degrees of faith that don't bring you to um, a saving point. Well, this has been a major discussion among scholars, and I would, today would start by tying that discussion in with this understanding at the very get-go of how Fletcher influenced Wesley's later theology. Here's my bold assertion at the beginning. I want to state that after 1770, which was really the beginning of Fletcher's checks to antinomianism, which he wrote uh, a huge debate with the Calvinists who had tried to basically make Wesley look bad, uh, when he wrote a statement about how the Methodist doctrine had gone too close to Calvinism. So they got angry and they tried to form a body of... Um, kind of like miniature theologians to come against him. And the result was that John Fletcher, Wesley's contemporary and younger friend, stepped in and debated them on every point. He actually won the debate. And I'm here to uh, try to get modern scholars to reconsider um, John Fletcher's theology, especially his teaching on the dispensations, period. I'm not saying that his dispensational teaching lines up with Calvinism. Modern dispensational teaching is that God could not work the same saving plan throughout all Christian history. So there had to be new plans based on new time frames or time periods in history. And these different periods are called dispensations. And it's all based on Calvinistic election and obviously John Fletcher was contending against Calvinistic election, so he did not support that same theory. His terminology, as I said before, is just a, a way of rephrasing Wesley when Wesley talked about degrees of faith. And so my bold assertion that I want to make at the beginning of this is in regards to the baptism of the Holy Spirit being equated with entire sanctification. First of all, I want to say with Timothy Smith that that teaching started with John Wesley, not with John Fletcher, as we will see.
And then that John Fletcher just expanded and made more consistent Wesley's theology up to that point. I also can show you that John Wesley equated his theology with John Fletcher's, and this is also a contention today among many scholars, that Fletcher had more impact and influence on Wesley's theology than any other. But how far? To what extent? I would go so far, and here's my bold contention, that I would even say that every time Wesley um, permitted for John Fletcher to write the term baptism with the Holy Spirit in regards only to entire sanctification, that that usage became Wesley's as well. I would say that Wesley was in full agreement after 1770 with Fletcher's discussion of the matter. Now I am aware that he wrote a letter and uh, where he contended with uh, Fletcher during that same time frame in 1770 and he said that we have differences and I, it wasn't in regard to baptism of the Holy Spirit. We have to be very careful when we read Kenneth Grider's discussion of the matter he equates the two. That's why he makes another argument because otherwise he would have no grounds to stand on where he argues that Wesley when he's using received the Holy Spirit he's he, he's also discussing baptism of the Holy Spirit and he equated the two. Well, I don't believe that's how Wesley's full usage um, can be described, because Wesley at times did not use the words receive the Holy Spirit when he was talking about baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so clearly he was discussing something else. My second point of contention, and this is um, to support what I just stated, my, my first support of that argument would be this, that after 1770, you're not going to find Wesley discussing baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, when, when he's talking about entire sanctification, you're not going to find him do that uh, with a broad scope description where it could include justification. The place you're going to find that kind of terminology in Wesley's writings is back in 1754, mid-career Wesley, uh, when he is telling you at the preface to those New Testament notes, which he wrote, uh, that, first of all, he is taking over the work of other individuals. Matthew Henry Poole, you know, he's not saying that everything that he writes there is completely his whole picture. Secondly, he argues that this, these books are to be used by all his uh, lay preachers, uh, the New Testament notes and the, and the major sermons that he wrote, to, to form doctrine in one sense. But just to give them the base understanding of what the scripture is talking about. He says that I would not go so far as to make doctrinal discussion. He purposely leaves out big words, which would be baptism with the Holy Spirit. He leaves that out of his discussion when he's interpreting things because he's trying to tell you this is a base level uh, understanding that he's trying to give his preachers um, of what the intent of the scripture was. To make whole entire systems of doctrine out of the New Testament notes and mid-career writing of Wesley is not wise. And so again, that writing came before, not after 1770, when Wesley made his final uh, discussion, and I would literally say this was the mature Wesley. So this is the final stage of Wesley's doctrine. It would not include a broad scope discussion of baptism with the Holy Spirit in terms of justification. Only earlier did he use that reference. Could he have just been quoting someone else in passing, as we know he did a lot in the Old Testament notes, which was written years later. Um, he was basically just rewarding the works of others, um, not necessarily in agreement with everything that was being stated there, uh, but just doing the work quickly and editing the work quickly, as we know Wesley did. Um, the bottom line is that where does this whole argument start? Well, I have to start where Wesley did. Wesley, in, in the early Wesley, uh, so we're talking about 1738, really back to 1725, and all the way through uh, the earliest years, I would even say to 1765, we find Wesley uh, teaching that people in the Old Testament, and including John the Baptist's experience up to Pentecost, he would not permit them um, the full contention of Scripture. He struggled with giving Old Testament personages uh, 
Christian experience. So if you go into his earliest writings, and I have all this sourced in my two in my three books, The Great Privilege of All Believers, that's the first volume, The Holy Remnant, and the one that I'm discussing out today is the third volume, The Two Gospel Axioms. But I have all this reference and research in those books, and you can find these references there. But Wesley, first of all, stated that the apostles were not saved. He called them unconverted, that's his literal words, prior to Pentecost. Well, he teeter-tottered over that understanding uh, as his de doctrine developed after 1738. So we find when he's talking to Count Zizendorf in later 1738, he argues with Count Zizendorf that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or equal terminology, when the Holy Spirit was poured out uh, on the apostles was actually a deeper work. So here he is going against himself just a little while earlier when he said that the disciples were unconverted. Later, if you look in the journals, you also find Wesley temper this statement when he says they were not converted in the proper sense. Now we know with his terminology of sin, willful sin, that he uses sin in the proper sense. Well, here we're talking about what he meant. What he was getting at was degrees of faith. He's trying to tell you that they had some degree of faith now, but he's saying they did not have entire sanctification, that degree of faith they had not attained to um, prior to Pentecost, which is an accurate teaching. So we see that Wesley, there's always two Wesleys that we're discussing and need to when we're understanding the full picture of Wesley. There's the private Wesley who is forming doctrine and who will start to show the germinal seed of his later um, full understanding. And then there's the public Wesley who might still be writing uh, as I am contending he did, from 1725 all the way to 1765, statements in his minutes and in his doctrine where these unsettled matters he won't bring to the full picture yet, and he might actually deny what he's starting to believe. He might say that these things were possible. So, for instance, in 1765, in the plain account of Christian perfection, he wrote and he said that we should not um, equate New Testament personages' experience with that of Old Testament figures. We can't use them as the primary um, experiential standard for those today. And so he says, uh, all the way from the time of Solomon, all the way up till now, there probably was no person who um, lived without sin. So he's saying in the Old Testament, at that up to that point, again, it's not 1770 yet, that he would deny them uh, the Christian's experience, which he contended for his whole life, of victory over willful sin. Um, so if he's denying them that victory because of their time frame they lived in, obviously Wesley was not a person with a very broad definition yet of saving faith and what, what is the specifics of privileges for believers who are of a deeper faith. So you can see that he's developing throughout his career. Well, if you move on, Wesley comes back in 1783, and uh, this is the mystery of iniquity. He has a sermon where he boldly states that these people that he's already denied have faith in the New Testament notes, showing that there's a lot of things that we got to be careful about when we read the New Testament notes. He now gives them faith. He says uh, in 1783, which is after 1770, he says Ananias and Sapphira truly had faith. If you go back to the New Testament notes, he denies Simon the sorcerer had faith. Well, now he would, he would reconsider that stand. If you go through... Uh, there's, there's others in the Old Testament. He clearly said, even earlier in sermons, like the great uh, privilege of all those who are born of God, which is an earlier sermon, Wesley argued that David was clearly born of God. Why would he say that David, an Old Testament personage, is born of God, but the apostles themselves were not? You have to understand that he's talking about the critical issue here of degrees of faith. And so, obviously, uh, Fletcher started underneath the influence of Wesley. And so that's my first contention. So how impacting would modern scholarship say that Fletcher was on Wesley? Well, here's a quote from one of them. It is difficult to account for the fact that only scant attention has been given to this man. Now we're talking about John Fletcher. Who more than any other, apart from Wesley himself, molded Methodist theology in its early history. He was more systematic than Wesley, which I agree with, Overcoming the limitations imposed by the, the latter's itinerancy. So when, you know, this man's riding horseback around preaching all the time, he's not going to be like John Fletcher who 
uh, often struggled with illness and stayed home and was a pastor and, and was able to uh, write out and thoroughly discuss the matters and make things consistent. So Fletcher brought a consistency to Wesley that was not there before. And to his checks to antinomian, Wes, uh, antinomianism, Wesley gave his approval. And again, I would see, he would say he gave his approval. I would say he went so far as to equate his theology with Fletcher's. If you watch um, the later letters of John Wesley when he was being attacked um, by many of the ministers of his time, he starts to argue because they were using Fletcher's um, words against him as well that both me and John Fletcher state this, both me and John Fletcher state this. He's literally quoting them as though they are the same system of theology. Um, Wesley wrote a sermon that, if you look, it's a, this is critical evidence here, that it's called On Faith, and what's interesting is he's discussing the degrees of faith, and in it, at the end of the sermon, he comes up with a discussion on the dispensations of Fletcher. And he's literally quoting the dispensations of Fletcher, and he does not correct them. He does not come against them. He actually acts as though they're his own belief. Uh, and he writes a much broader scope definition of faith. You'll notice that Fletcher came um, directly out against Wesley's earliest um, definition of faith in his works. He, he stated very strongly that Fle he quotes Wesley's um, definition of saving faith, and he says it's too um, narrow. And there's no way that Wesley, who's reading this man's works, could ignore such a statement as that and not act like um, he needed to deal with it. So Fletcher made a very bold um, front to Wesley's statements. Thank you.